Those of you that are watching online, we welcome you from our house to your house. Uh, there's no place to be than in the house of God. I want to encourage you, if, if you're a part of this church family, if you happen just to stop by online or through Facebook or however you're watching this, there's no place. I'm, I'm glad you're watching. I'm glad you're connecting. But I'm telling you, there's a seat here for you. There's nothing like being in the presence of God with their family. Uh, I, I watch stuff online all the time, but that's, that doesn't take the place of the fellowship. That doesn't take the place of, the scripture says, do not forsake the assembly of the saints. Do not do that. That doesn't take place of family time. So anyway, I want to I wanna just this morning, let's, I want to encourage you to receive from God this morning. Let's get what's ours. And uh, before I do that, I'll just, uh, before I release our kids to our, their kids' rooms, uh, if you need an envelope for, your offering, for an offering, go ahead and raise your hand. An usher will assist you with that. And I want to read kind of quickly Psalm 23, and uh, it's always kind of one of my go-to chapters. And I'll read it all real quick, and I'm going to try not to get sidetracked. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Everybody say, I will fear no evil. I heard one man say, why would I fear anybody in the valley? The shepherd is the biggest one in the valley. Different perspective. I choose that one. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the prince of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely, everybody say, surely. In other words, it's going to happen. Goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I've talked about this psalm. It, it, it literally, to me, it literally starts with, it, it, it's like, it's life. It, it goes all the way around. It takes you to different seasons in life, the good, the good seasons and the ones that are challenging and the ones that were kind of scary that you don't want to relive those seasons. But through them all, the shepherd was always there. The shepherd was always leading. The shepherd was always guiding. And the main purpose behind it all is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, to remain with him. But anyway, <clears throat> concerning this right now, our tithes and our offerings, the last couple of times that I've ministered around this area, I've just encouraged you, church, and I, I, I pray that you hear my heart in this. We're living in some times that I really believe that you really got to, uh, it would benefit you greatly. If you are sensitive, if you put great importance to your finances and the Lord Jesus Christ, his direction. Because I cannot tell you, I, I'm not prophesying, I'm, I, I don't have a specific word for it. But I cannot tell you that in our, in our country, the economy is going to remain well or go up or people talking recession, depression, inflation, all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of commotion. There's a lot of chaos out there, especially when it comes to finances, church. And I want to encourage you when it comes to your finances, submit that to God. Submit that to the Lord. He's the one that promises to lead, to guide, to provide. But listen, it's not just uh, he does that for everybody. He desires to do that for everybody, but he can only do it for those that have it submitted to him. So anyway, concerning finances, church, in these times that we, that, that we navigate through, do not get into fear. Do not, do not get rattled. Do not get you know, under pressure financially, so on and so forth. But do, I said, do not, don't do those things, but do submit unto God concerning your finance. I am convinced 100%. Listen, I've made a little in my life. I'm talking about salary-wise. I've made a little, and, I've, and, and, and now I'm in positions where a lot more comes in. But through it all, God has remained faithful. My life didn't change because now all of a sudden I make more money at the end of the year. He's always been my provider. That check is not my provider. Listen, the economy does not dictate how I live. Now, I'm aware that it'll change circumstances around me. I'm going to see it around. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to pay more for a, a carton of eggs what, what, or a dozen of eggs. What did you tell me the other day? Huh? It's like, what did you say? She told me the other day she was putting the eggs in the refrigerator. She said, Jaime, I used to pay $139 or something like $139, and this was $399, right? I wanted to say, Bidenomics. <laughs> I wanted to say something like that. I said, well, no. The Lord provides. We Praise God. We got more than enough. Amen, church? 
that won't affect me. I may have to pay more at the pump or more at this or that. But listen, it does not change what Psalm 23, 1, verse 1 says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I've said it over and over and over. As long as you got him, you got everything you'll ever need and some. Amen, church? Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring our tithe and we bring our offering. And I, we pray over it this morning, Father. I bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we don't decrease, but we increase, Father. I've seen you do it time and time and time again. I thank you, Lord, that you and your resources and your faithfulness is not limited to this economy, Father. It's not limited to this world system. You are who you are, Father. And you will do what you said you would do, Father, regardless, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you concerning our finances. As we honor you, Father, I thank you, Lord. You always take care of us. You always take care of your word. I thank you. You are the shepherd, Father, that provides, that leads, and that guides. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Let's go ahead and pick up the offering, church. And I appreciate you ushers helping with that this morning. I want to move in, kind of transition into it really quickly. Uh, if you're a kiddo in here, we're going to go ahead and release our kids to their kids' church, junior youth. You guys are released, and uh, we're going we're gonna to get right into the Word. I think, I believe, for as far as announcements are concerned, we've got our women's meeting coming up this Wednesday at 7 o'clock here at the house. So women, be a part of that. Bring a friend. I know Stephanie, Miss Stephanie, some of the ladies are working on some details concerning upcoming events. Uh, you men, if you missed our men's meeting, get with Pastor Willie. There are some details and information he gave out about some upcoming events and stuff like that. In the beginning of the year, as I, I, I told you guys that the word for us, the challenge, the exhort, exhortation, the theme was Haggai chapter 1 and 2. Well, the book of Haggai, not very big. We're talking about the glory of the Lord and filling the house. And how many of you know that, that when a word is released, I want you to, this is a side note, but, but this, this will help you in your personal life. Whenever God speaks something to you, you can almost rest assured that there will be some kind of resistance. It's just nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Satan does the same thing over and over and over. What do I mean by that? A word, a word is released. It's not like the devil's going to sit back and just, all right, let you have your party. Okay, perfect example. Heavens open up. Word comes from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We've all read our Bibles. What happened immediately afterward? Satan comes immediately challenging, testing, trying to stop that word. If you are the son of God. Wait a minute. God just spoke. We don't need to add to that. We don't need to take from it. God just spoke. But Satan comes immediately. All right. If you want to, I mean, in the garden, God speaks. God says something. Immediately, Satan comes in and tries to distort, manipulate, change what God is. What is he trying to do? He's trying to stop God's word from coming to pass in your life. So when the word is released... If God speaks something in your prayer time, and I hope you guys are having really, really good prayer times, intimate times, but God speaks something in your heart. God may speak something to your heart about, you know what, we're going to get that, your, your child that, that is wayward, that is maybe away from the Lord or not doing good right now in life. God's saying, I'm going to do something special in his life. And man, that's a word. And, and in your heart, you receive it. You're crying, you're rejoicing. And then tomorrow you hear that he's acting more of a fool than he ever has before. God, what happened? The resistance to the word coming to pass. <clears throat> you don't buckle, buckle under that. You don't, you don't panic. You don't give up. You keep going. And I told you guys in the beginning of the year, excuse me, I told you at the beginning of the year that this house and your house will be filled with this glory. I'm full aware. I'm full aware. When you say something like that, the fight is on. The war is on. <clears throat> Not fighting against each other, the enemy. You think I'm going to back down because of that? The Bible says, listen, listen, guys. I'm trying to teach you how to win in life. The Bible says you take prophecy, and what do you do with it? You, you make a cute little song about it. You write it down, put it in your, do, do all that stuff. But the Bible says when you take, when you, you take that prophecy, that word of what God's going to do, and you fight with it. Why? Because there's going to be a resistance. The Bible says you, you, you warfare with the prophecy, with the word that comes forth. Why? Because God is telling you there's going to be a resistance. But greater is he that's in you 
than he that's in the world. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to trap. And his word will not return void, but it will accomplish what he sent forth for it to do. I mean, you got all this stuff in our Bible. So this house I proclaim before you, this house will be full of, it, of people, of his glory, of his manifested presence and power. Can you say amen to that church? That's walking by faith. It, is, it isn't, you don't live like, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, no, you don't, listen church, to, to, to truly live like the children of God, to walk by faith, church, you don't, you don't allow circumstances to dictate. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow the economy, what our government leaders or what's happening in another country determine what happens in my house. Just because they're saying recession, just because they're saying depression, just because they're saying that wars and all this kind of stuff, now all of a sudden they're going to affect uh, what happens in my house. Now all of a sudden we're going to lack finances. We're going to lack peace. We're, wait a minute. Does that mean they're more powerful to remove God in my life? Now all of a sudden God cannot operate in my life? We either believe this or we don't. And if you believe it, you'll act like it and you'll have the result. But if we're, us as believers are like sheep without a shepherd, I must say it, there's a lot of people in the body of Christ that are sheep. They belong to him, but they ain't following the shepherd. I'm going to be very honest. I'm not being critical, church, but I'm, I'm, I'm here trying to help this morning. There are a lot of more people that have more, that put more emphasis on the words that come out of CNN or Fox and they do the word of God. So don't complain at the end of the day. If it's not working for you. You can quote whatever news people they are, whoever is up there speak. You can quote them better than you do Jesus. But so-and-so said this. What did Jesus say? Anyway, I'll move on. I wasn't part of my message, but the house is full of his glory. Amen. Let your house be full of his glory. I want to read something really quick. If you've got your Bibles, and if we can put it up there, guys. Psalm 27 and verse uh, 13. We're still talking about the glory of God. We're still talking about Haggai. We're, we're not going to necessarily read there from there today, but we haven't gotten off topic. But tw Psalm 27, verse 13. Miss Stephanie ministered a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was out of town, and I was, I was logged on, and I was hearing what she was saying, and, and I just kind of, it was... It was ministering to me, and, and a lot of times when that happens, I want to kind of, kind of just, just add to that or piggyback or add, you know, tag on to that. But she quoted this scripture. She was talking about the goodness of God. Uh, uh, hope you guys were here. Hope you heard that message. But Psalm 27, verse 13, this is David speaking. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let me read it one more time. I would have lost heart. Some, one translation says, I would have fainted. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And if you, if you kind of analyze that, if you kind of take time in, in reading and just think about that scripture, church. Maybe a lot of us ha are in a situation like that. Or maybe a lot of us have been in a situation like that. Where David here said, if you, if you look at what he's saying, Steph, he was pretty much saying, I'm not seeing God's goodness right now. And if I go by what I'm seeing, if I go by what I'm experiencing... I would faint. I would lose heart. I would lose confidence. I would lose faith. He said, I would have fainted. I would have fallen. I would have quit. I would have given up had I not believed. That's faith. Had I not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In fact, when he said this, he necessarily wasn't seeing the goodness of the Lord. I think he was still in that situation where everything I see is contrary to this goodness that I'm believing for. Now, David had already seen a lot of his goodness. I mean, David had seen God's faithfulness over and over and over and over. But if you read the Psalms, if you study his life, he had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. Through it all, God, I mean, one Psalm can be how great God is. And the next Psalm, it seems like, my goodness, David, do you even know God? Woe is me and this and that and what I go through. Up and down, up and down. He was a musician. Oh, he was an emotional type of guy. <laughs> Musicians are different. They're in touch with their feelings and all kinds of stuff. David was kind of, I admire David, but he went through different seasons. 
And here in this point, he says, I would have fainted unless I had believed the good, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And this morning, I'm going to do the best I can to try to encourage you this morning on some things. Stephanie made a, 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 a statement, and I'm not, I mean, I get it, probably not going to get it word for word. But at one point in the message, she says something like, if God blesses you with the new, the new car, you know, God is good. Right? We've got that phrase in the church, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good, right? It, it's kind of, you know, it's cool or cliche, catchy or whatever, right? So God is good. We all know that. God blesses you with the new car, and when we try to give praise to him, we say stuff like, man, God is good. God is faithful. But how many of you know that God is good when you don't get the, good car, the new car? You getting the new car doesn't change who he is. You getting the new car doesn't mean he's a good God now. He's always been a good God. He is a good God. He will always be a good God. What you see, feel, and experience does not dictate who he is. And as human beings, and with us having these five physical senses and, and going through stuff and seeing stuff, a lot of times what we see out there will determine or dictate our perspective, our perception of who he is and how he is. And that's wrong. Let me try to give you an example here. All right, I've got five kids, five, I've got four daughters, and I've got one son. And who I am on a ba daily basis to them, how I conduct myself or what I have to do, what I have to say, my parenting, my fathering of them is different many, many times on a day-to-day -day basis and based on the circumstances and uh, situation we're in. Who they need me to be, let me put it that way. Who they need me to be on a, any given day differs from day to day. Zion is at the point where he's our baby boy, and he's at the point where, uh, where my little boy is starting to need some correction. Uh, he just turned one year old last week, and, and, and I've been more of the disciplinarian in my family, in our family, and about two months ago, Steph mentioned the word spanking, and he mentioned spanking and Zion in the same sentence, and I just thought like, hey, we ain't ready for that. I said, oh, calm yourself down. I, I, I just, you know, I, but he got into this little, this little phase for about two months that he would hit, he would just, he would hit, especially when he'd get tired. Late at night, he's past his bedtime, he just, he was just cranky and he just hit. And, and I, a lot of it, I, I blame us, I blame my daughters, because we'd, we'd, we'd play with them and kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're teasing them and punching them, and then I, not punching them, but just kind of playing with them. So, so when he'd do it, and the girls would be like, oh, Zion, Amber's the worst. You know, Amber's like, ah, you know, like making a big old deal out of it. I said, you can't do that, sweetheart. I said, you're confusing them. One time we're playing with them, and then all of a sudden he does it back, and now we're correcting him. He's eight months old, nine months old. Right? But one of those mornings, one morning, you know, it'd been, it, I wanted, I got up and said, I'm a great husband and great father. I said, Stephanie, you stay in bed again <laughs> for the 14th day in a row. <laughs> Mother of the year. Stay in there and I'll take the child. Right? So I took him and, and man, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I, I got this little routine with them sometimes where I just, uh, out, you, that little car you gave us the other day, uh, really, I put them, I stick them in there and we walk the neighbor. I'm literally pushing, it's a car about this big and I'm just pushing them, right? One day, he, you know, it was early in the morning, he drove for like, I mean, he was there for like 30 minutes or 20 minutes and after a while he was just, I mean, he was asleep at the wheel and I'm pushing them all over. So anyway, we do, he got, that morning I didn't want to go out and i just in the kitchen and he's pointing to the window, right? He wants to go out. I was like, man, I don't want to put my shoes on. I don't feel like going for a walk right now. So I'm there with Zion, right? And I, I, he hit me one time, and I thought, ah, and I, I was, it was early in the morning. I wasn't ready for it. Now I'm like, yeah, this boy starts, he's going to start needing a spanking really quick, right? I started thinking, and I, and I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an a aha moment with my son. I'm going to show him that I'm bigger, that I'm stronger, and that I'm quicker, right? I want him to look at me that morning like, wow, this is my dad, right? So I, I saw his hand winding up. I had him like this, and I saw the right hand starting to wind up, and he's fast, and he's strong, and he just, wow, he, he come, it comes flying around, and I just, like Karate Kid, I just caught it in the air, right? So I'm thinking, 
I mean, this is all like split second thing. I'm thinking like he's going he's gonna to be amazed at how fast that was. And I'm going to squeeze his hand a little bit. So he's going to feel a little bit of that pressure. And he's going to be like, oh, wow, like I can't do that to this man. Right? So, so, so I got him right here. And I see the hand winding up. And I go, what? And then with his left hand, bang, he gets it. <laughs> I'm the one that had the aha moment. He literally went, boom, got his hand, boom. <laughs> so, but anyway, all that to say, um, Zion needs, starting to need some correction now. He, he, man, my little boy, he, he, he's always on the go. He just, he, he wants to be doing stuff. You know, he, so he, and he's, he, if you put him on, he doesn't want to crawl anymore. He wants to walk, but he can't walk. So he wants you to get him with one hand and he wants to go everywhere, nonstop. And you put him down, and you go, Zion, no, no, you'll start crying, and, and you give me, you know, give me your hand, pick me up, we want to walk, that kind of stuff. So he's, he's needing correction right now because he's just in that state. We've got to get him out of this little phase he's in. But how many of you know that now he's starting to see that side of us, that doesn't mean we love him any less. What he's needing from dad right now is correction. You get to my older daughter, I'm going to give you different scenarios here. My, 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 my next older, second child, or your second youngest child, Aubrey, you know, she just celebrated a birthday too. I mean, we have so many kids, it's like we're celebrating birthdays every month. So she just celebrated a birthday, and, and, and I took my older girls to a basketball game, and they, you know, need, they, got, they got to get signatures of some really, really good athletes, or one really good player. When I got back, you know, I, Aubrey was kind of like, Dad, you didn't get me anything, blah, 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 this kind of stuff. So anyway... Been working on getting some tickets for next year, trying to surprise my daughters on some stuff and that kind of stuff. So I was able to score some tickets for next year, next season. And I just told the guy, I said, hey, listen, the sales rep, I said, hey, listen, my daughter just celebrated her birthday. I didn't, get to, I didn't get to take my daughter to an NBA game, WNBA game. I said, you guys have a number 24. And in my family, and our, all my girls were number 24. They're uh, Dallas Wings. Uh, best basketball player is Aribe, Arike, something, and number 24, so on and so forth. I said, hey man, can, is there any way you can hook me up and get some, get some merchandise, autograph merchandise? I really would like to surprise my daughter. So anyway, long story short, the guy gets back to me and says, I'm going to get you an autograph basketball, I'm going to get you an autograph picture, so on and so forth. So I'm waiting for that to come in, and I knew immediately where it's going. It's going to Aubrey. Aubrey's the one that, that missed out on that game. Uh, last night we get home, and we went, you know, we did a few things. We had a busy day. And, and at the end, it says, Dad, we're, we're, one of my daughters has to sleep. Anyway, I'm trying to wrap, I'm trying to go quick here. So she says, Dad, where am I going to sleep? She's got her own room, but she doesn't like sleeping in her own room. Dad, where am I going to sleep tonight? I said, tonight you sleep in my room. Our, they, our kids love to sleep in our room. So I'm just, I, she's seeing a different side of me where I'm, just, I'm just, just giving, right? So with Aubrey, I'm giving you a situation where this week, a scenario, an example where, where I'm giving, told you, Zion, my baby boy, he's, he's seeing a corrective side, of, more of a corrective side of me. Bree right now is experiencing more of a, 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 dad just got the open hand. I went to go see Joe Beverly last night at, like right before they have a gun expo um, at, the, at McAllen, and I went real quick. I mean, five minutes before they closed, I was looking for a certain something, but I want to go say, just say something to him real quick. They introduced me to the guy who runs uh, the expo, spent a few minutes talking to him, and the guy said, hey, come back tomorrow. And I said, yeah, I'll be here. I'm going to bring my family, and, and I'll, I'll look around. I'll be here tomorrow. So he says, hey, get, he set me up with the pass where me and all the girls, me and all my family can go, for, get, go in for free. It's 50, there's a bunch of us, 50, 60 bucks. And I'm walking out. I said, oh, I didn't expect that, but tomorrow we get to all come in for free. That's 50, 60 bucks. Hey, praise God for that, right? It's the open hand of God. Man, I love it when God does that. I wasn't expecting, I didn't meet, I met a man, talked to him for two, three minutes, and bam, favor of God, blessing of God, right? All right, so that's the open, breeze. I told you, is experiencing right now, the last couple of days, the open hand of a father. Then you get to an amber, right? An amber right now, my, 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 I'm going somewhere with all of this, church. Then you get with an amber, was a little bit older, and she's, she's, she's at the point where, you know, she'll ask about bedtime. She'll ask about certain things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to say something. I'm going to take a pause. This isn't part of the message, but I, was, I felt I had to address this. She's at the point where she, she's got her own phone now, and, and, and during the summertime was able to use her phone more, spend a lot more time than during the regular school year with the phone. Uh, so, so now that school starts tomorrow, Tonight, rules change in my house. You're not going to stay up till 11. You're not going to stay up till 12. 
You're not going to stay up past 12. In fact, right now, we're going to readdress our, our bedtime and the whole phone issue. Now it's going to go, you're going to use that a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot less. Now I'm going to pause there and go over here and take another trail before and I'll get back on that one. When it comes to us parents, this isn't a parenting seminar, this isn't a parenting message, but I, I, I wanted to share this, church. I felt this for about a week or two. Just admonish you, not admonish you, but just, just bring this to light. Parents, I want to I caution you and challenge you and encourage you to take inventory of how much time your kids are spending on these devices. Not just the time, but what they're doing on these devices. Listen, I'm right there where you are. I've got, I've got little ones. And let's be honest, it is real easy to give them a phone, give them an iPad, give them a device so that they can give us some me time, some quiet time, so I can do. Now we, can get, we, can, we can come up with reasons why we do what we do, so I can clean the house, so I can read my Bible, so I can, I can do all of this. But listen, there is no excuse for just releasing the world, World Wide Web, into their hands so that we can have some... I've analyzed this. I've looked at myself as well. So, Jaime, well, you, well, you would spend summer times. You'd spend sometimes two, three hours on Nintendos or Ataris and all that. And I said, yeah, because I, I said, Lord, what's the difference between now and then? You know, because I, I don't want to do wrong with these electronics. And, 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 you know, my summer times consisted of we get up in the morning, you go out there and play. Then it gets really hot. Mom calls you in for, for lunch. You eat lunch and then you play two, three hours of, of Nintendo or whatever. And then, the, then after that, you go back outside. So, so I know there's got to be a balance. I'm not against electronics. And they're probably like, hey, is he really going there? The youth, yeah, um, it's for your own good. But it's not just release and not. Now, I'm also going to say this. I am aware of the fact that there are probably people here and people watching online that are addicted to phones. Adults. I've actually said, Lord, how do I do this? I actually have started feeling a sense that I need to pray for some of us in here to get free from the addiction I said it, addiction of this thing. Sometimes you think of addiction and you think of only a drug addict or an alcoholic. But if you're spending, I'm not going to give you a time frame. Ex you go to God with that. Or if God were to speak to you right now and say, do not touch this thing other than to text somebody you need to text or call somebody, but stay off of social media, stay off of that website, stay off. If you can't do it, that means this thing is elevated above God in your life. And I thought, I said, Lord, are you going to actually lead me to altar call to, for us to get free from these things? That's the day and hour we live in. So going back to them kids, if we just give it to them without any restrictions, without any parenting, without any guiding, what are we setting them up for? When our kids are kind of like, Dad, tell the waiter I want a refill. You got a mouth? Open your mouth. Ma'am, sir, can I have a refill? They can't. They're just... So anyway, with Amber, going back to... There's, that is kind of a... A direction. Me being a father, in that sense, putting, now we're going to go to sleep at this time. Why do I want her to sleep at a certain time? Because we got school in the morning and I need her ready to go. And I know that her body is growing and she needs X amount of hours. And I know not just to grow, but physically and health wise, you, 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 you people, sometimes I, I marvel when somebody says, I go to sleep at one and wake up at five. I, I'm amazed. I like, I want to be like you when I grow up, the getting up at five part. I want to be like you. Cause man, five o'clock, it's like, man, it's, it's pulling teeth in my house to get up. But, but to, to just sleep four hours and stay, I'm going all over the place here. But it, it, so, so you saw with, with my baby, it's correction, the first one. The second one, it's an open hand of God, the, the, the open hand of a father. Then the third one, it's more of a direction. This is what we're going we're gonna to do. And you can get a Jamie, my, my next one, right? She's the next one. It's a bunch of them. I got Aubrey, Amber, you can go Jamie. Jamie comes up to me and says, hey, dad, 
uh, there's a party next week over here, so can, can I go? She may get a yes from me or she may get a no. And, 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 and that no, maybe I may see something around the corner. I may see maybe there's a group of kids that are there. I, I don't want her there. Maybe it's a place where, no, I just don't think it's the right atmosphere for you. I just don't, I don't want you there. It may be, a, I don't understand why. I just feel like it's not a good thing. Uh, I don't have a reason. Listen, parents, listen, young people. Sometimes we don't have to have a reason for our no. I heard one man, amen, in the back. The first two rows are very, very quiet. And my daughters are looking at me like giving me their mother's look. We don't have a reason to have to have a reason to say no. All right, so that, that's more of a, a protection. I, I'm keeping you here. Dad, why can't I go? I just, you're not going to go or you're not going to be there or no, you're not going to participate in that. It's a protection. And you get to my oldest one, you know, we came back. Uh, from out of town about a week, week and a half ago. And on the way back down, we stopped at a university around the Austin area, Belton, Texas area. And praise God, my daughter's got, my oldest daughter's got her first official offer to play college basketball. And we're barely going into her junior season. And, but going into that, going into that, I sat her down and said, hey, listen, when, when coach talks to you, you say yes, sir. You say no, sir. You look in the eye. You, how you shake your hand? How to conduct yourself? There's a teaching and there's a training and there's a, listen, a preparation. How? Don't come across as a 14, 15-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid that just doesn't understand life. Come across as someone who's got some maturity, some understanding. He's wanting to invest in you. Show him that the investment is well worth it. Stand up straight there's a there's a, 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 a there's a, a training in that the bible calls it perfecting but god is working on all of you for a perfecting you're never going to be perfect but we ought to be getting better the bible calls i'm perfecting you you may say i make tons of mistakes i make a hundred mistakes a day but god may be saying yeah you used to make 110 it's okay we're perfecting we're getting better. So I gave you all five kids. I gave you all five different scenarios. How many of you know that they saw a different side of me? One was correction. One was protection. One was direction. One was open hand of God. A whole bunch of different scenarios, different examples, different feelings that came about. But how many of you know none of them changed who I was? I was a good father in all of them. Whether I said yes or no, whether I gave or didn't give, whether I did something with the smile or didn't, I remained a good father in all of them. And as I think about God and our relationship with God as our father, a lot of his parenting, a lot of his being a father to us is not just the open hand. A lot of it is protection. A lot of it is, is, is perfection. A lot of it is direction. When that doesn't necessarily, if you don't, if, if you don't catch yourself, it doesn't really, um, when God says no, I want to go on this vacation and, and God says, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let it happen. A lot of times you don't attribute that to his goodness. You heard a no, like my teenage daughter said, I can't go there. I didn't say it because I'm a bad guy. I want to lock you up in your room like Rapunzel. 17 years old and still watch Rapunzel. <laughs> Just kidding. She doesn't. It, 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 a lot of times we may hear a no. We may hear a correction. We may hear a God. But, but it's amazing. We get the new car and we're on a high. God is good. Wait a minute. He was good when we didn't have the new car yesterday. And, and we won't go there, but going back to the book of Haggai, I want to just show you where these people were. At one point, the, the children of Israel were the most powerful people on the planet. Brother Jerry Savelle was here, Dr. Savelle was here, and he talked about favor. They were the most favored people on the planet. Why? Because God was with them. God was for them. So there was no nation on this earth that could overtake them regardless of size. No nation that could overtake them. No nation that could beat them. They were blessed with prosperity, with health, with provision, with all of that. God was good to them. They saw that side of God. But listen, by their choices and their consequences 
of their choices. They lost the blessing of God. God had to, rem they removed, let me put it that way, they removed God's hand over them. And, and as we've talked about it the past couple of weeks, or, or the year really, now all of a sudden when they removed the blessing of God, in came in, not necessarily correction, but correct, can, yeah, anyway. Now all of a sudden the Bible says that, that, that they were overtaken by enemies. They destroyed the temple and took all those people captive. And now, look at me for just a second, they were slaves. They went from being feared by everybody to now all of a sudden they're slaves. They went to where, where God's blessing was in abundance. Now all of a sudden they're being, they're dependent, not dependent, they're bound to those individuals that are going to tell us when we're going to get up, where we're going to go work, when we're going to come back, how many kids we have. If we do have kids, those kids are now bound to them. Uh, 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 what we're going to eat, when we're going to eat. Now we have no say. So we went from being God's feared, chosen, most powerful people to being now slaves. Now I have to say this again. That happened not because God was a bad God or God forsook them. That happened because of misplaced priorities. They disobeyed God. They removed God's hands. And the consequence was because of their own doing. Then you get to the point when Haggai comes and he, the Bible says that they were now released from that captivity and now they can go back to their place where they were before and now they could rebuild. But because it wasn't perfect scenario, perfect, uh, everything was perfect, they felt some resistance to rebuilding the temple. Now all of a sudden they left the temple and they began rebuilding their lives and they're living, listen, mediocre lives. They go to work at eight, they get back at five, their marriage is okay. Their relationships are okay. Their finances are okay. They're not experiencing glory, per se. It's just, we're getting by. How are you doing? How's your marriage? It's okay. How are your kids doing? They're kids. Eh. How are the finances? Could be better. How are you doing? Well, I'm alive. We're getting by. So they went from glory to bondage to okay. And church, how many of you know that in all three of those seasons, all three of those, whatever you want to call it, God remained consistent. God remained good. He didn't change who he was. He remained good in all of it. We may see a different side of God, and we may, what, what, what I'm trying to get at this morning, church, what my encouragement to you this morning is that just because you may have Things happen in your life or things not happen in your life. There's a tendency as human beings to want to view God based on what we experience. And that is false or that is, that is wrong, that is dangerous. I'm going to share something. I told you I wasn't going to take long this morning. But I want to read out of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. I'm going to minister something, and I'm going to close this morning. Revelations chapter 21 and verse 4. But before I read it, um, if you're there, great, just, just put your finger there. When I was in Bible school about 20, 21 years ago, something like that, I was a young, young believer, super young learning about the word, learning about faith. And I remember Isaiah, we got a phone call, not a phone call, or one of our leaders. It may have been Brother Philip who was here last week. He said, hey, they let the whole student body know, hey, can you guys pray? We just, we just heard word that Pastor so-and-so, a pastor that had gone through and taught there at the school, his granddaughter was, was riding a horse and got bucked off the horse and gotten, gotten hurt and sent to the hospital and life was kind of on the line. You guys, a lot of you have been there and they have a go-kart area. And I'm a young believer, super young. And I, the and Bible says about God healing. The Bible says he's a, mir he's a miracle working God. The Bible says that whatever you ask in his name, he'll do. So, I mean, I'm hearing all this. My faith is growing, but I'm a little bit immature. 
in, 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 in how God operates. And to this day, sometimes I feel like I'm still a little immature. I still don't know how God operates in, in, in every situation scenario. So anyway, I went to the, I went to the, I don't know, whatever, there's hundreds of us students there. But to me, in my mind, I couldn't wrap my mind around that at a while. I was like, it's a pastor's daughter. He's probably a pastor's full of faith. And this family's probably full of faith and church people and good people. And how could that happen to this little girl? And, and I went to that, 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 that um, golf, what do you call it? The, the track, the go kart track. And I just spent, I don't know, I was there for a while just praying over this little girl. Praying over this little girl. Praying over this little girl. Finally that night I go back to my dorm room and I say, hey, anybody hear about that little girl and, and, and what happened? He says, hey, that little girl ended up passing away. And it hurt, man. It, it, it hurt for, for that little girl, but then it hurt also the, un, the, mis, the not knowing. Let me put it that. Lord, you're, you're a good God, but why did a little girl that, that, that's from a good, I didn't know her. Good girl that goes, you know, belongs to a good family. The grandfather is a pastor, and I don't understand how that could. And it bothered me, and it, and, it, and it didn't sit well. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand the why. And just like I said, that there are reasons why, uh, there are reasons why sometimes we say no. That we don't have to explain our no. There are things that will happen under the sun that we may not understand. And we may not ever know, and and and, and it's okay. Now, I am not at all about to say that that was the will of God that that little girl go home. Not, that's not where I'm going. But when I wanted to know a, a why, well, I wasn't even in a position. I think if God would have spoken to me, I don't think I was mature enough to even hear, be able to understand and discern his voice because my mind was all cluttered. My soul was all cluttered. I was down. I was kind of like, Lord, I was really, really bothered by it. And some fear wanted to come in. Wait a minute. If that's a man of God, if he knows how to operate in faith, if that could happen, listen, Satan will do that if you don't watch it. Well, if that happened to that person and they have more faith than us or they're in the ministry, then that means that could happen to me. Satan's number one tactic, one of his number one tactics. And it was in that, that I learned this lesson early on that I've had to remind myself a whole lot. You do not dictate, you do not allow circumstances that happen to other people dictate your faith or your perception of who God is and what he will do in your life. I'm going to tell you this right now. If something happens to me tomorrow that you have no idea, something bad, it's just not going to happen. But if something bad happens, I'm just giving you, hypothetically speaking, something bad happens to me tomorrow, that does not change. If you may not understand what happened in my life. Why? Whatever. You don't understand why. But that does not change who God is. I'm going to tell you right now, God is good. And way back then, God dropped that in my heart. God, somehow, I, I don't remember how I came to that understanding, which now it's like, yeah, obviously. But you don't allow things out there to affect your perspective or your perception of who God is and what he will do on your life based on somebody's experiences, somebody's... Here's what I'm getting at, church, what I'm trying to get to this morning. It's not easy for me to minister I'm not going to say it's not easy. I, I don't know exactly how to do it. So, Father, I ask that you give me understanding, give me the words, and give us all ears to hear what you were saying, what you would say in Jesus' name. Revelations 21 verse 4 says this, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, nor shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Let me read it again. And God shall wipe away, wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. In fact, let's, do, let's read this together. Here we go. Ready? Read. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now, this is future tense. I believe this is talking about heaven and eternity. And I want to minister something really quick, or not really quick, in closing. I want to minister this. 
One of the biggest misunderstandings I think there is in the Bible, and not in the Bible, in the church, is when we, in our understanding, a loved one goes home to be with the Lord. And because we don't understand, because we've never been there, because we've never been on that side, because we prayed that this not happen, it seems like our prayer didn't get answered. And what appears to be a loss for us because we're human, because we have emotions, because we lost a loved one. I don't even like using that word. We say it all the time. We lost a loved one. It seems as if, as if in that case, God didn't come through. And this is what I want to minister this morning in closing. Is this big, I, I really believe that we see this this, this um, transition from here to there, I think we're not in sync with God when it comes to this. I think our perception and our perspective is totally off. Because if you go to Psalm, the book of Psalm, the Bible says this, this is God speaking. How beautiful, God said this, how beautiful is the death of my sons or my servants. We go to funerals. I don't know about you, but I don't like going to funerals. I'd much rather go to weddings, birthday parties, dedications, a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't like going to hospitals, and I don't like going to funerals. Like yesterday, I went to the hospital, and I brought up some feelings, some deja vu stuff, looking for a parking lot. And I literally, in my mind, thought, I do not like being here. I've been here way longer than I'd like to be. Brought up the feelings again. But you and I have been there, done that, and, and, and in the last couple of years, there's a lot of us in here that maybe have had a loved one go, I think everybody in here has had a loved one go home. And church, I'm getting to the point in my life where, where I look at that transition period, not that I'm looking forward to it, but I tell you with all my heart, I don't fear it. And as your pastor, I'm going to do the best I can going forward for the next 10, 20, 30, however long God has me here. Is I want to raise, I want to be a part of helping God raise a body of believers that we do not see the, the end of our earthly lives here and, and fear it and afraid of it. Because I truly believe this. The, that, the reason why God says the death of his servants is beautiful, because to God, that's a, that's a, a, a coming together. That's a, he's, he's receiving. We may feel it like a loss, but he's receiving. And that individual, I'm going I'm to tell you this right now. I, I got no business leaving this earth anytime soon. No plan on leaving, no desire to leave, nothing like that. And I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. I'm using my faith to stay here as long as I need to, to be a husband to her, to be a father to my kids, to be a pastor in this church, and finish my assignment, finish my work here on the earth. And when I'm done, when I'm satisfied, that's when I'll go. Hypothetically speaking, if I were to go tomorrow, you know what my encouragement to you? Don't mourn. She told me years ago. I mean, if I, and again, we're faith people. We're not planning on leaving anytime soon. So, Jaime, mean, but if you, if I were to leave, Jaime, I, mean, I don't want you mourning me. I don't want you because we we're seeing some stuff. He said, "You see that, Jaime? I, mean, I don't want that to be you." Because if we truly believe, listen. I'm trying to encourage you this morning. I really am. Because if you truly believe this, we truly believe who he is. The whole purpose in, in Jesus coming and doing what he did was that one day we'd all be together for all eternity. And that scripture that we just read, that there would be no more mourning, there would be no more death, that there would be no more tears, that there would be no more pain. That's our destiny. That's where we're all heading. 
And like I said, I got no plan on going anywhere anytime soon. But I'm telling you this right now. If I were to go tomorrow, please don't stay behind. Do not question God. Do not get mad at God. Do not get offended at God. Don't even ask why, because it really isn't any of your business. Because the why will get you stuck and starting to view God from a different angle. And you may get a bad angle that ain't even God. When Moses said, let me see your goodness, God had to give him, listen, an angle. Let me put you in a position where you'll be able to see me for, for who I am. Moses wanted to see, what are you like? All right, stand right here. I'm going to walk right here, and you're going to see my backside. And ba his backside, the only way his perspective that day, Moses' perspective was like, you're merciful, you're, you're caring, you're good, you're, 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 you're good. That was the glory. Moses wanted to see his glory. He made, he, there's so much of God that Moses didn't see. But what he did see was, you're good. He saw a little bit of God. He's way more than good. He is good, but what I'm trying to say is, is there's so much that is wrapped up in his... Moses just saw a little bit. But when we get caught up in, in doubt and unbelief and fear and anger and hurt, some of us may be a little bit hurt at God saying, God, why did you not? And, and we're looking at it all wrong. God, why did you take him? God, why did you take her? Maybe God didn't, maybe it wasn't their time, but I'm telling you right now, the enemy may have struck a blow, but God made sure that he was going to get the last word Amen. and that we would win. Let me, put, let me put it this way. If the enemy, if the enemy were to strike a blow to one of us, which in the name of Jesus, let's say no weapon formed against us. Brother. Stay in faith. I'm not, this isn't, I'm not backing down from faith. Right. Not one bit. But if the enemy were to strike a blow, the worst he can do is what, church? You meet Jesus way fast or faster than intended. But how is that a loss? Okay, three of you, four of you. You cannot see it now. That's why I said, I pray God give us ears to it. Because it took me a while to really, really get to this place where I don't fear death. In fact, the, the, the second coming of Jesus, the rapture and all of that, when I was in my 20s, not, I'm still a young guy. But when I was in my 20s, I was like, man, I'd hear people, especially older preachers, say, man, I want him to come now. I want him to come now. I was like, hey, well, hold on, man. You've lived your life. Let me get married at least. Let me experience you know, heaven on earth. That was good, huh? And I was like, man, pues bien valientes. I mean, they're in their 80s and their 90s, and now they're saying, come Jesus. I'm like, but I'm in my 40s, and I'm I still got a lot of life to go. And, and, and there's been times, not because I want to tap out, but I look at it, because this has been my prayer, show me more of heaven, Father. Show me, because I, I just came to the point, Amy, where I realized, wait a minute, 90 years here on the earth compared to eternity, which is go and not, I mean, how can I explain eternity? Just go, 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 go. 90 years, which is like, like this compared to all eternity. Why am I so focused on the this where I'm going to spend a whole lot more time out here? So I said, God, start revealing more of that to me because we're so consumed with CNN and recession and, 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 and this virus and, and now monkeypox. And we're so consumed with this. When, when we get to that, uh, we, we may not even remember the this. And we're so caught up over here. And we're so caught over here. It's like overwhelming us because that's all we hear. And in reality, it is minute. So why am I so focused on, on are we going to survive this virus? Are we going to survive this economy? I mean, are we, when, when this is minute compared to that, and that is, the Bible says that how beautiful it is when we, that's what you're preparing us for, for all eternity. You're going to wipe this away. You're going to, this, this whole planet is going to be folded up like a blanket and done away with. And, and you talk, I mean, there's so much in the future that I don't understand. I just know it's good. Why don't I focus more on where I'm going as opposed to where I'm at right now? So I started praying, Lord, show me, give me a little glimpse of heaven. Show me, Father. And as I started praying, now this, this is even pre-COVID. It's been my prayer, some of my attention. So my heart started changing. We're like, hey, Lord, 
You know which one also? Which one did it for me? I was preparing for a funeral, doing a funeral. And Jesus' words were this when he told his loved ones. He said, if you truly love me, you'd ha be happy for me because I go to my father. I said, whoa. Jesus told the ones he loved the very, very most. He knew they were going to miss him. He knew they, they wanted him to stay. But he said, if you, I, I think of Jesus like a little boy, kind of like, I'm going back to dad. I'm going back to my daddy. I'm going back to glory. I'm going back. I came and did what I needed to do, and I love you, but, but, but man, I'm going. I, I have been where you have not, and as much as I love you, and as much as I, I wanted to please him, and I wanted to be a blessing, as much as I, I would love to stay, you just never been there. I have, and I get to go back to him. So he said, if you truly love me, and you understood what's about to happen, you'd be happy for me. I was preparing for a funeral when I read that. I said, my, he told the ones he loved not to cry. He was saying, don't, don't mourn me. He said, you'd be happy for me if you understood. So what has been my prayer? Lord, help me to understand what's taking place here. So as I said, if something were to happen and tomorrow, I'd much rather you guys not be, why? Have your funeral. Not your future, not, not mine, I'm gone. <laughs> and get up here and talk about how great I was. And do all that. But don't mourn me. Rejoice with me. Amen. And here's the other one. Please don't question my God. Please don't question his faithfulness. Because you have no idea on the why. And I'm pretty sure God's not going to reveal it to you. And you may be questioning God's goodness, but I want to tell you this. You're wasting your time because you're questioning his goodness. And I'm on this side of eternity wrapped up in his goodness. Amen. You're, you're missing it here. Stephanie ministered that a couple weeks ago that what we see sometimes affects what we would consider I don't know if you say it any better than I can, but what we see sometimes affects what we would call good or determine God to be good. Can he gives you a new car, God is good. Listen, car or no car, headache or no headache, job promotion or no job promotion. Things got better this week, things didn't get better this week. You found your lost puppy, you didn't find your little. Just trust me, or rather trust God, that in all of that, God never changes his goodness. God never changes who he is. The picture is way bigger, and in fact, let me tell you this. You have, I really believe that we have fallen way short of giving him credit for how good he truly is. He's done more for us than we're aware. Maybe that's why that dropped it. I wasn't planning on connecting those two. But maybe that's why God dropped them out of my heart way before in here when, when I went up here and I started the service. My part in that is that he has not gotten credit for how good he is in our lives. He is really good, church. And I want to encourage you, admonish you with this. There is nowhere in the world you can look and you can look and you can look and you can look and you're not going to find anything better. I know this is not proper English, but you're not going to find anything gooder and God. He is the goodest. He's the very best. And he is faithful. He is wonderful. I'll wrap it up with this. One day, church, you can believe it now or you can believe it then, but you're going to waste a lot of years in between. You're going to waste a lot of years in between thinking of stuff you didn't need to think or asking questions. One day, we're going to step into eternity I wish I still had my dad here. I know what, I, what God did for my dad. I know that. So, well, well, weren't you believing for that? You have no idea what God did in my dad's life. You have no idea. One day I'll share, I'll share more of it. And I, and I saw God's goodness and God's faithfulness. I wish I had my brother Rick. I mean, it's, that's, it's not easy right now. But I know this. One day... We will step into that. 
And when we look back, Santos, the darn question is not even worth, not even asking, it's not even worth thinking. The why? The mission? We're going to be so caught up in glory, so caught up in perfection, so caught up in the will of God, so caught up in glory, that for us to spend, even though it's all eternity and we, now we've got tons of time, for it to give it one second to look back, and Lord, what about, it's going to be like, it's going to, I don't, we don't even need to go there because we're in the very, I told one person, you may not understand right now, and this may help you, may not help you. I don't know, but I know this for a fact. Right now, it may be hard. But when you step into that, you're stepping right back into the will of God with your loved one for all eternity and all of this. Yeah, we're going to miss them. Yeah, we may go some years. Yeah, I'm not saying don't miss the loved one. I'm not saying that. But mourn is something different. In the beginning, there may be grief. In the beginning, there may be mourning. But at some point, you pick yourself up because you like talk and say, I know in whom I have believed. All these loved ones that have gone on before me, I don't say, I've lost them. I, just, I know I'm going to see them again. I dream about that. I've asked God, God, what's my dad doing right now? My dad is not in the cemetery. My dad is living in glory. What's he doing right now, Father? I just ask questions like that. What's he, what's he doing right now? And I do this a lot. Send, tell him this. Tell him that. Do I miss him? Yeah. But listen, I, I'm not in mourning. I know where I'm. Maybe that's why now I'm kind of like, I wouldn't mind God coming right now. Anyway, I just know this. I, I don't have all the English words to maybe put it, but when we step in there, guys, it's going to be like, we don't even have to, I don't, even, I don't need any answers for it. God, you're going, to see, you're going to see a different, a better, a bigger angle of God that there is no questioning his goodness. I mean, you are overwhelmed. Here, at times, we may have to walk by faith. David had to walk by faith. What do you say? I choose to believe that I'll see the goodness of God. Over there, you don't have to walk by faith. The goodness is all over you. In heaven, you won't need faith to be, to see his goodness. You're wrapped all around it. So this stuff won't even matter. And that's where we're going, church. I'll close with this. My second or third or fourth or fifth close, whatever this is right now. Shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I really forgot what I was going to say. I guess it's closing time. Whatever it was, it was good. I'm sure it was good because I was about to close for the fifth time on it. So let's pray this morning. Do you believe God is good? Amen. Do you know God is good? Amen. Amen. It had something to do with goodness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we worship you this morning. And we praise you this morning, Father. Because you're good. Father, we believe and we know that you're good, Father. And we've seen your goodness and we'll continue to see your goodness, Father. But in the highs and the lows, in different seasons, different valleys, Father... What circumstances and what people may say, Father, that does not change who we see you to be in our heart, Father, which is a good shepherd, a good father, a wonderful father, a faithful father. And this morning, Father, as I've ministered your word, I pray, Lord, that you will, you'll take these words and you'll continue to minister to our hearts and to our minds, that we won't be affected by what happens out there in the world. We won't be shook. We won't question you, Father, based on what other people say. Or even what we see in our own lives, Father. If things aren't perfect right now, Father, we choose to know and believe that we serve a perfect God. So, Father, I thank you for understanding. I thank you for peace. I thank you for love. As I ministered this, Father, there's people that heard it, people that may hear this five years from now. I don't know. But when, when it hits our hearts, Father, I pray grace for healing. Father, I pray this, if there's any of us right now that have maybe have gotten offended at you because we don't understand, forgive us. And I pray for that individual, Father, that they'll come to a point where they'll, they'll realize, Father, you weren't against me. You didn't withhold from me. That you're going to make it all right. You're going to make it all perfect when the time comes. I thank you for that, Father. I pray for that individual. I pray for all of us, Father. And I pray this for our church, for this church. We are, that we be not a people, Father, that we fear the transition. I'm not going to call it death because we go from this life to another life. Father, that we not fear that transition, Father, but that we all get to the point that we look forward to it because we know 
You look forward to it. You said how precious that occasion is that we all get in agreement and line up with you. Not to leave any sooner than we have to because we have a responsibility to finish our assignment here. We know that. But when that assignment is finished, Father, that we look at that period as a time of rejoicing, a glorious time, a wonderful time, a time that you look forward to, and so do we. But in the meantime, Father, help us to do what we're called to do here. Help us to share your love, your grace, your word with those all around us. Help us to harvest, to reach this world for the Lord Jesus Christ and share your love with them, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone says amen, amen and amen. Well, we love you. God bless you. You guys have a great rest of the day, a great week. Those of you that are starting school, have a great start of school, and I will see you very